Amazon Prime's drone delivery service takes another step forward. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Jonathan Ruprecht, aviation attorney, commercial pilot, flight instructor, and contributor at Forbes.com. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me. How did you get involved in the drone world? So I ended up getting involved in the drone world uh, in a long time ago, actually. I built an unmanned aircraft uh, when I was uh, in the summer when I was, I think I was like 14 years old with some people at my church. And so started that. And then later on in my last year of law school, started integrating, learning about the integration of Japanese drones into the Japanese airspace, comparing that with the manned integration or the unmanned integration here in the United States. Uh, I took that, ended up publishing some works out of it, and then later on started my own law firm doing nothing but drone law. So that's kind of how I got into it all. Amazon just took another step towards delivery by drone when the FAA granted permission for Amazon to begin operations. So what does this mean for the industry in general? Sure. So the, 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 what's going on there is that in order to fly commercially, uh, to do package delivery right now, the, the most, I guess, one of the ways that most people are doing it is under part 107. But the big problem there is part 107 limits those package delivery operations to only visual line of sight. So you're not going very far. So if you want to actually have the largest footprint of available, you know, kind of like potential customer base per uh, drone operations kind of landing port, uh, then you're going to want to fly beyond line of sight. And then that requires a whole other set of regulations you need to comply with. And one of them requires you to actually have an operating certificate. And these regulations weren't designed for unmanned aircraft. They were designed for manned aircraft. So a lot of things need fixing with an exemption. So Amazon ended up actually obtaining that exemption and the operating certificate. But there's a little kind of gotcha when you look down into the exemption that this is only for one operation area at like a test site. So it's not like nationwide approval as kind of a lot of people kind of would think. What are the airspace implications within the 400 foot drone ceiling and how will Amazon's UAVs share the air with other commercial drone operators? Yeah, that's a great question. So there, there's some aspects there where people are trying to look at primarily how to deconflict from uh, drone on drone kind of impact, uh, mid-air uh, collisions. Uh, and so the, there's an aspect where some aircraft, uh, people are looking at them to put uh, onboard air-to-air -air radar on them for deconfliction purposes, as well as also maybe using like remote ID where all the unmanned aircraft uh, operating in the area might need to actually, well, would be required to actually uh, talk uh, to each other via an overall system that the FAA has in place currently, and so that they could kind of deconflict uh, that way. But that still assumes everybody's participating. So there's an aspect why, why, what, that people point out that you need to have onboard radar to detect any non-participating uh, drones, maybe some bad actors that might be flying around. Do you ever envision a day when operators will have to pay for access to airspace? I don't know. Um, the, 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 that's a commodity. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a very important point. Um, I know people might want to be trying to chop it up and uh, sell it off, kind of like how the FCC has certain spectrum and they kind of license it off. Then you kind of have the access to it, kind of like it's your own like private highway in the sky, where then you might have to pay some company like, if you will, like a drone turnpike to kind of get to certain locations. Um, you know, that could happen. There's also a lot of people that could be very extremely upset about that as well as how does that practically interact with uh, the overall idea that this is like everyone's national airspace and not just kind of, uh, you know, if it's a funding issue, um, then, you know, like, there's some questions there, like, why is it a funding issue? Is it really that big of a need? Are we having that many drones? I know a lot of people are kind of talking about this, but there need, so people really need to dive into the numbers to actually see, like, is there really actually that many drones operating at that level to the point where we actually need to chop it up? Um, I, I don't think at this point we, we have that currently. I, we've actually had kind of it, what it seems like is with the drone sightings data we talked about previously, for the last five quarters, the drone sightings data has actually decreased, and that was pre-COVID. Um, so th there seems to be an overall thing here where it's kind of like your iPhone. When you, buy the, you bought the iPhone and then a new iPhone comes out, and you're like, why would I buy another? And so you have people kind of not buying you know, too many more uh, drones. It's kind of like that. It's kind of almost like an AR-15, right? Where someone goes and buys an AR-15 and they're like, well, that's really cool. And they put it in their closet and they don't know what to do with it next. And it seems like the drone craze was, it was similar to that back in like 2016, 15, 16, 17. And you kind of see more and more of a, a, a rapid drop off when people acquire drones. So the numbers may be large, but the question is also like, how many of those are actually being used? I don't think it's that many. And so the projections, I think, uh, need to kind of be, be heavily tempered. And some of the market forecasts 
um, are actually quite a few years old and everything needs to be kind of updated. So there's, there's money interest there, but then there's, I think, numbers that really don't support the justification for chopping up the airspace. What are the safety implications for drone flight over people and even beyond the line of sight for the pilot? Yeah, for over people, the FAA is looking primarily at two different things. Uh, one is that they're looking at uh, when the aircraft actually impacts the person, how severe will it be? Uh, because not, a air, not all unmanned aircraft are created equal, right? There's certain types of material. Some are made out of foam that, that actually have a very, allow, uh, if you will, lower, a low amount of kinetic energy is actually transferred, right? We understand that. Would you rather get hit with a bowling ball or a bowling ball full of a bunch of foam, right? Um, and you're like, I'll take the foam bowling ball, right? And because it actually decelerates over a period of time. And so some aircraft have actual uh, designs. Uh, they're designed in a certain way so as to mitigate and keep the severity level low. Uh, so that's due to the aircraft and its size and weight. There's also laceration issues where uh, the FAA is looking at it is they don't want the propeller uh, lawnmower, lawnmowering uh, people, right, or, and slicing them up. And there's been multiple injuries where that's happened, where uh, people have been hit in the head and there's blood everywhere because it'll cut their head or they'll lose an eye. So you actually have like a permanent eye loss uh, that'll happen. So that can be somewhat serious. So that's how it is from the from the operations over people, they're looking at it from the severity of impact uh, as well as the lacerations. Uh, those are the two big hazards there. And when you get into flying beyond line of sight, the, the issue there is how do you deconflict for non-participating people in the airspace that you cannot actually see? Because you you currently have your your uh, Mark I uh, uh, set of you know detect and avoid sensors that God gave you, right? You have your eyeballs and you Deconflict, but when you're out out of the range of your sensors, right? Then how do you actually deconflict? That becomes a big problem. Um, is it you know? So some theories are like I'm gonna see all the other aircraft, the manned aircraft in the sky, and then be able to kind of just like if I have really good telemetry, I can kind of figure out where they are and then fly away. Uh, or maybe do I want to have some type of onboard detect and avoid system uh, that has own, its own airborne uh, air to air radar, so I can actually detect. But that has problems because it's you know there, there's actually field of view. So if you have a you know, you're throwing out the radar uh, waves going this way, but then the you know another aircraft's coming in this way. That becomes a problem, especially if it's coming up, you know, in, a, in a, another collision course in your blind spot. So there's a whole bunch of issues there when you go beyond line of sight from just a mid-air collision standpoint. And then, how do you not fly over people uh, or, or potentially congested uh, areas? So, so you've got the the drone pilot's perspective, but how will air traffic controllers have to change their procedures to accommodate? this new traffic variable? Yeah, it's a great question. So the FAA has been actually updating things uh, with the air traffic controllers um, they're in, in some of their guidance documents, so 7400. Uh, so with, with, with is, is the transponder uh, code that is auto-squawked, uh, it's auto-transmitted in a, in a lost link uh, fashion. So that way when um, the, the and it's the same thing for manned aircraft, we have uh, special types of traffic uh, if you're flying, you're on a, on, a, on a flight plan and you lose your, your, your radios and everything, you can actually try to say, hey, I have an emergency. They're going to see it on their system that you had an emergency and they're going to quickly figure out that you actually are unable to communicate, right? Because there's some emergency, some equipment failure. Well, they have the same thing now that they've actually been baking into drones and in at least in the procedural aspect and well, the bigger drones can do that and they can auto squawk. So let's say your drone uh, lost link for some reason due to uh, jamming or something broke or your equipment broke or some failure, then all the air traffic controllers can actually see on their screen a pop-up 7400 and they'll know that, that the aircraft is lost linking. They need to know, well, that particular aircraft, let's look at November, blah, 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 and look at what it uh, what is already the pre-coordinated actual lost link plan. It'll go to some location, loiter, you'll try to require it. If it doesn't, it'll go to another place and then it'll do, eventually, it's, it's called a flight termination point and it kind of loiters there until you either get it or it runs out of fuel and you, make, you want to make that like an uninhabited area. So that's, that's typically how that happens. And they've, they've actually been preparing for that. All right, Jonathan, what are the next steps you see for Amazon's prime air? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, their big problem right now is to try to actually expand the drone operations outside of that test site location. So that's, the, that's going to be the big problem right now. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a really large task to actually go about obtaining a Part 135 operating certificate. It's not just where you have to deal with the FAA. The Department of Transportation is also involved. And they actually look at it from an economic authority perspective. So there's two different agencies you're dealing here with, with two different sets of regulations, with two different 
uh, they're evaluating everything heavily. Not, not only just the pilots and the aircraft, but uh, the DOT is going to be evaluating the uh, the qualifications of so of the management as well. So it's it's an it's a much more comprehensive review of the operations than what most drone operators uh, are used to. Jonathan Rupret, aviation attorney, commercial pilot, flight instructor, and contributor at Forbes.com. If somebody wants to connect with you, Jonathan, maybe they want to sign up for your newsletter or just um, connect with you in general, how can they do that? Sure. Yeah, they can head over to my website. My website is jrupreclaw.com, or if you just type in drone attorney, I'm probably one of the top ones that'll pop up on Google. So, All right. Well, thanks again. And find more of my interviews right here or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.